Well, this text is one of the reasons I love Advent. It reminds me of the promise of God with us, Emmanuel. Um, but just like everything in Christmas, we always have the ten tendency and temptation to domesticate and water down the truths of Christmas, to take this truth of God with us and reduce it down to something nostalgic or sentimental. Uh, we can do that because that's what our culture does. Um, you notice if you go to the malls, you'll, you'll hear all the carols that we sing. You'll hear them all. Um, I'm struck. You ever find yourself just walking through the mall, hearing these Christmas carols and asking yourself, is anyone listening to this? Is it anyone understand the weight of what is being sung right now? Um, we were sitting at a restaurant and not only were they playing these songs, but there was someone giving commentary on the song while we were sitting in the restaurant. But no one was really paying attention. And we were just, oh my goodness, the full weight and the implications of God with us. Um, we can lose that because our culture just waters it down. It's just background noise. We can do the same with, with Emmanuel. But what does... Advent's promise of Emmanuel, Advent's promise of God with us, what can it offer us today? What can it offer us under COVID? What can Advent's promise of Emmanuel offer to us during a global pandemic? Well, if we treat the promise of God with us just sentimentally, then we'll miss the whole impact of this promise. But is there something that Advent offers to us? Is there something that God with us offers to us under COVID-19? Answer, yes, yes, absolutely yes. But not if we reduce it down. Not if we reduce God with us down to warm feelings or sentimental thoughts or feelings of nostalgia. Even for us Christians, when we think God with us, what does that mean? What's the full impact of God with us? Sometimes we can reduce that down to just, hey, when I go down to Ocean Beach on a clear day and the sun's about to set and I experience the sunset and the beauty of the colors in the sky, I can feel God with us. And that's true. But is that all? Is God with us just those moments of transcendence? Is God with us just those moments we have, even singing these songs where we just recognize the weightiness of God, when we recognize the big picture of God? Is, is God with us simply an experience of transcendence that we can have moments by moments by moment? If that's true, then we're just going to be chasing the experiences. We're going to be chasing those moments. You might find yourself down at Ocean Beach quite a bit, just chasing those moments of God with us, God with me. I want to feel you. I want to experience you. And then, but that's reducing God with us down to just a feeling, down to just a moment when God with us is supposed to be something far more than that in our lives. So let's not reduce this down. Let's just take a moment right now for whatever we think God with us means. Let's, let's allow God's word to revise, edit, transform the way we think of God with us. So the promise of God with us means from this text, we can do three things. One, we can name the darkness. Two, we can receive the promise. And three, we can defy the threat. If these are the things that God with us means, this is what, this is going to change things for us. It's a game changer for us. So first of all, the first thing that we can do when we really know God with us is we can name the darkness. Let's set up the context for this passage of scripture. If we know this passage of scripture from the New Testament. When God gives the promise to, to Mary and Joseph, this is God with us. This is Emmanuel. We know this. And that is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 7 that we're looking at. So what's the context that we find God with us 
in Isaiah 7. If we can understand that, then we'll understand what it means for Mary and Joseph and what it means for us as well. So King Ahaz is the new king of Judah, and it's dark in Judah. It's really dark in Judah. Israel in the north is already broken off, and Israel in Aram is looking at a common threat of Assyria. Assyria is coming, and it is the imminent threat coming uh, against the western side. And so Israel up in the north has allied itself, an alliance with Aram, a pagan nation. And they have formed an alliance in order to thwart the enemy Assyria. Okay, now Israel is called Ephraim here in this text. So Ephraim is Israel. Israel and Aram were enemies. But as you, you've heard that phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's what's at play here. Israel is saying, okay, enemy Aram, we have a common enemy, Assyria. Let's form an alliance together so that we can ward off Assyria. So they form this unholy alliance, and they want Judah in the south to be on board. Judah's not on board yet. And so here comes in the north, Israel has a let Aram come into Israel from the north, and it is now stirring at the door of Judah. And that's the context here. Before, in chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, verse 30, it said this, in, in Judah, if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and distress, and the light is darkened by its clouds. So the, the light that was in Judah is getting obscured by the coming of storm clouds. And in chapter 6, we have that really familiar passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, it starts. King Uzziah was a good king, but then he dies. And Isaiah the prophet is wondering, oh, oh no, we had a good king. Now what's going to happen to Judah? And that's when God gives that great vision where Isaiah is there in the, in the temple, and the glory of the Lord fills the temple, and he sees angels, and they have six wings covering their faces, covering their feet, and they're flying, and all they say day and night, day and night, day and night is what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory, and in that moment, Isaiah he starts becoming aware of the darkness inside of him. He says, oh, I am a man with a dirty mouth and I live with people with dirty mouths and my eyes have seen the king. And so he anticipates the next foot that's going to drop is the foot of judgment. And he's in the crosshairs because he recognizes the darkness of his sin. And what happens? An angel comes, take a, takes a coal from the altar, touches Isaiah's lips, and he is cleansed. And this is demonstrating that God is a gracious God. God is a God of grace who saves the sinner. Now, when we move into chapter 7, the question is, is God a gracious God to a whole nation? God is a gracious God to sinners who recognize their sin and need a Savior. So Isaiah was saved. But will God do that for Judah? Will God do this for Judah? And, and so we come to this new king, King Ahaz, who follows Uzziah. And he's not a good king. He's an idolater. And he has allowed Judah to cultivate idol worship and paganism in Judah. And so judgment is coming. And you have this stirring of Aram in Israel up in the north, and they are shaken. They are shaken. If you look at um, verse 2 of chapter 7, you'll see it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. So that, that phrase... Um, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. It indicates that they are stirring. Aram is stirring in, in Israel. So it's right at the doorstep. And so you have this pagan king who's an idolater, 
And then, so that's an enemy from within. And then you've got the Aram, Aram coming from the north. There's the enemy from without. Enemy within, enemy without, darkness comes, they are shaken. They are shaken. Now, Yahweh sends Isaiah to Ahaz, along with Isaiah's son, whose name is Shir Jashub. His name literally means a remnant will return. So Isaiah and his son, a remnant will return, goes to Ahaz, and God says to Isaiah, I want you to meet Ahaz at the aqueduct. If you notice that, verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, go out, you and your son, Shir Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Why is that location significant? Because the vulnerability of Jerusalem and Judah was that its water supply was an outside, above-ground water supply, meaning that if Aram came and cut off the water supply, then Jerusalem would be helpless. They wouldn't have water. And so this was the main threat. This was the vulnerability, and Ahaz would know that. So God wants Ahaz to go to Judah's greatest vulnerability. Look at this water supply. Look at where you can get cut off and cut down. And I want you to meet me here at your greatest insecurity with the threat of darkness coming against you in Aram. I want you to stand right here, face your anxiety, face your greatest threat, and I'm going to give you a promise. Anyone relate? God ever say to you, I want you to face your fears? God ever say to you, I want you to see the threat that's coming at your door? but I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to speak to you as you look at it. That's what he's saying. The, the implication of God with us, when you know God is with you, it allows you to stand and face the darkness that's coming against you. We don't normally want to face the darkness. We don't normally really want to deal with the, the threat of COVID or the threat of a marriage difficulty, or the threat of sickness, or stage four cancer. We don't normally want to deal and face that. We would rather try to find some sort of escape or some way to cope with it. But what God does by saying, no, I want you to go and I want you to face the threat, and I want you to face that insecurity that you have. What God is saying is, I want you to name that darkness in light of who I am. Name the threat in light of who I am. Now, what happens when we do that? When you name the threat, when you name the darkness, in the context of the presence of God, that darkness takes on a little smaller form, doesn't it? You see that darkness in perspective. You start to see the situation and the threat that's coming against you in light of who God is. So when you, when you say to God, or sometimes, you know, I've heard people say to me, look, I, I hear what you're saying about what God, God is with me and, and so forth, but you don't know my situation. You don't know the struggle that I have to really face. You don't see the magnitude of the darkness. And in that moment, that's when God is saying, that's because you don't know me. You don't see how big I am in the midst of it. You've lost sight of that. So walk into that anxiety, walk into that insecurity, but don't go alone. Walk with me. And when you walk with me, then name it. Name the darkness. Now, it's really important that we do name the darkness. Whatever the, the threat you feel today, whatever you feel like is going to dash your hopes or dash your your dreams or dash your, your desires, whatever you feel like is that threat. If we don't see that threat with God, then we're going to make that threat to be something much bigger than it is. And we're going to trust something else to save us from it. So if COVID is your biggest threat, if COVID is the biggest darkness that's coming at your door right now, then your savior is going to be the vaccine, right? 
If, what else is your threat? Name the threat. Name the darkness that you feel for yourself. What is at the door that threatens your security, that set, threatens your sense of significance, that threatens your dreams, your hopes? What is it? Name it with God. With God. With God, name the threat. When you name it with God, then you don't have to be afraid of the threat. Amen? Amen. See, Christianity is a reality is a reality based faith. Christianity walks into reality. It doesn't escape reality. It doesn't deny reality. It looks right into the face of reality and says, "My God is with me. My God is greater than the darkness. My my God is greater than the threat. I'm not going to look at the darkness without God. I'm only going to look at the darkness through God's eyes." That's the only way to do it. So God invites us to, to do that. Go and name the darkness. Now, I want you to notice here what God does here. <laughs> um, I love this. Look at verse 4. He says to Isaiah, I want you to say this to Ahaz. Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. It's kind of like that phrase uh, they used in Britain a lot during World War II. Uh, keep calm and carry on, right? Keep calm, carry on. Do not lose heart. Now, listen to this. God says, do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and of the son of Remaliah. So, so God is saying, I know you're looking at the threat of great military armies. I know you're hearing from all of your covert agents that there's great military might coming at you. What does God want him to do? God wants Ahaz not to look at all the military might. He wants to look at the two people who are behind the military might. And he calls them, what? Two smoldering stubs of firewood. It's kind of a demeaning term, isn't it? It's like, they're just little wicks that are about to lose their flame. And the truth is, that those two guys, the leader of Israel, the leader of Aram, they were both going to die shortly after this. And that's what, that's what God wants them to do. Name the darkness, but name them through my eyes. Realize they're just two smoldering wicks. I want you to think the same thing with whatever darkness you're going through right now. Think about if it's COVID, I want you to think right now, what would God want you to call COVID? What would God want you to call whatever the threat might be? If you see COVID as some great monster that's bigger than God, then you're not doing it with God, right? But when you see COVID for what it is, you're saying, okay, this is a virus, right? A virus that has potential to do great harm, but God's bigger than the virus, right? God's bigger than everything. And because God is bigger than everything, then it allows you to say, okay, this darkness does not have to crush me. This darkness does not have to be the end of me. Not because, it's because God is bigger than this darkness. So name it, name it. Name it the way that God would have you name it. Whatever that darkness might be, whatever the threat might be, addiction, fear, sickness, COVID, name it with Emmanuel, name it with God with you, because it's not going to undo you if you do that. It's not. It's not going to crush you. Paul said the same thing in Romans 8. He named all the forms of darkness that were there, angels, demons, sickness, persecution, and then what did he say? Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing, nothing. That's why he could name him. He named him knowing none of those things could crush him because nothing could separate him from the love of God. And that's what we're invited to do. So what is the darkness that threatens to undo you? What is the darkness that threatens to undo your hopes, your dreams, your security? What is that darkness? Would you walk with God and name it? Name it the way that God would have you name it. So that's number one, name the darkness. Number two, 
receive the promise. When God walks you into that insecurity or the threat that's in front of you, God will then give you a promise. God will say a word to you. God makes a promise to, that brings Ahaz to this moment of decision. In verse 7, here it is. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. Or, or so he's, let's go back to verse 5. Verse 5, Aram, Ephraim, remember Ephraim is Israel, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin. So here's what they're saying against Judah. Let's invade Judah. Let's tear it apart, divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabeel king over it. Okay, so this is the threat that's in front of them. This is what they're hearing that's coming at their doorstep. And I love this. One of the most important words you can, you can take away from this. Verse 7, yet. <laughs> yet. Whenever you hear the threats, whenever you feel shaken by what's going on outside your doorstep, always say, yet. Or as it says in Ephesians 2, but God. Yet, the sovereign Lord says this, it will not take place. It will not happen, for the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. It's just this guy, smoldering firewood, resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. See that? The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. You know, that's a little dig. He doesn't even say his name. He's just, he's the son of Remaliah. Come on. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So this is the moment of decision. When God says, look, it's not going to happen. That's a promise. God promised the destruction that they're talking about is not going to happen. That's a promise from God. Now, whenever God gives you a promise, you are faced with a decision. The decision is, will I trust God? Will I receive the promise? Or will I go my own way? Will I go my own way? And this is what he says. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you don't trust this promise, then you're trusting yourself. That's not the way of faith. If you don't affirm me and you don't affirm this promise, then you will not be affirmed. And so Ahaz has a choice to make. Now, God goes further. Verse 10. Against the Lord, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. So God gives Ahaz a promise, and then he says, ask for a sign to see whether this promise is real or not. Ask for a sign. Now, this is not normally what I would advise anyone. If you're making a decision, you've got a decision to make, you know, should I take this job? Should I start this relationship? Whenever you've got a decision to make, I would not advise you to ask God for a sign, right? I know we do that. I know we, I know we, we tend to do that. We're, there's a lot of Gideons in this room, right? We're always asking God for a sign. Lord, show me something that says, yes, yes, okay, I can trust you in this promise, right? So I wouldn't normally say, you know, go ahead and ask God for a sign. Um, but God says, ask for a sign, <laughs> Ask me for a sign. And if you ask me for a sign, I will, here's what he says, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights, that means ask for God to do something in the heavens or on the earth, because God is willing to move heaven or earth to show you that his promise is true. Wow. What a gracious word. God has given to Ahaz. And mind you, Ahaz is not even a believer. He's not even a believer. But this is what God is doing for him. This is grace. This is grace. So, what's Ahaz's decision in this moment? He's called to trust in him. But here's the problem. Ahaz is not, doesn't have any faith to draw from. When God reveals himself and says, ask for a sign, Ahaz has a vacuum of faith. There's no trust going on with Ahaz. And so he doesn't have anything to draw from to say, yes, Lord. Yes, I'll trust you, Lord. And so Ahaz rejects the promise. 
Rahaz, Ahaz rejects the problem. It's, and this leads to number three. If he had chosen to say, yes, Lord, think about the implications of that. He would have to, number three, defy the threat. If you know God is with you, you're the name, the darkness, you receive the promise, and if you receive the promise, you then defy the threat, which means that what God was saying to Ahaz is, yes, you see the stirrings going on with Aram right at your doorstep. It's right there. Yes, you hear the threats that you're going to fall, you're going to get torn into pieces. Yes, the threat's there, you hear it, it doesn't sound good or look good. And yet, if you receive the promise, you are to stand in the midst of that and defy the threat, defy the darkness, defy the, the gloom and doom, defy anything that says you're about to fall. Defy it. When you know God is with you, that's how you face the darkness. You face the darkness and you say, darkness, you don't have the final word. Darkness, you will not separate me from the love of God that is in Christ. Darkness, my God is greater than you. So I stand and I face you in the strength of God's love for me, in the strength of God's promise for me, I defy you because I trust in God. I trust in his promise. Thank you. Is there anyone who can relate to this? Is there anyone who has, who has tested this out to see that this is true? If so, you can say amen to. Feel free. Okay. All right. Good. Some of us, we have, we have done number one. We've named the darkness. God's brought us out, faced our insecurity, faced our fear, faced the darkness, and he said, name it, and you've done that. Number two, you've also received the promise that God has given to you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Or something particular, something unique, when you are there and you're listening to God and God may give you a word, God may give you some sort of assurance. That's true too. He may give you a personal promise in the midst of that. But for many people, I believe they have not gone to number three. They have not said in the strength of God and in the strength of his promise, I'm going to defy the threat. That's, the, that's perhaps the most important step you can take when you really want to know God with you. When you really want to know Emmanuel, the most important step you can take in that moment is to defy the threat, to stand against that darkness and say, darkness, you don't define me. Darkness, you don't have the final word. My God has the final word. That's when you really get God with me. That's when you really get Emmanuel. And I feel a lot of Christians are stuck in at number two. They're not ready to go to number three, where number three is the next step. And I think for many of you, number three is the next step. Now, sometimes we might react the way that Ahaz does. Look at the way that Ahaz does in, in verse 12. So God has said, here, here's the promise. And here's the sign. Ask for any sign. And what does Ahaz say? Verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, that sounds polite. It sounds even respectful. But what that really is, is Ahaz saying, no, nope, I've got my heart already set on making an alliance with Assyria. That's what Ahaz has in his mind. I want to get on Assyria's good side. So I want to get an alliance going with Assyria so that they can protect me from Aram and Israel. That's already in his heart. And so with that in his heart, he has already said, he's saying to God, mm, God, I don't want to put you to the test. Really, that's just a lip service. That's just a cover. It's really his doubt. That's the cover for his doubt. He doesn't want to trust in God. This is where a lot of people are. God, I don't want to, I don't want to put you to the test. I don't want to test whether your promise is going to be really 
good for me or not. I don't really want to see if your promise is going to really take place in my life because I've already asked a lot of you and you've already done a lot for me. You know, you sent Jesus into the world to die for me. That's plenty. I don't want you to do any more. What does Paul say? Paul says, if God would not withhold even his son for us, will he not also graciously give us all things? Romans, right? That's Paul's thinking. If God did give his son, won't he give you everything that you need? But our mentality is, oh, God, you've, you've given us so much already. I don't want to ask any more of you. So, yes, you've given me a promise. I don't deserve that promise. I really don't. I, I respectfully decline because I don't want to indulge, right? I don't want to indulge your grace in my life. And God is like, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Your whole life is based on my grace. Everything in your life is based on, your, on my grace for you. So receive it. Receive it. Take it in. Live in it. That's why I'm here. The sign that we have, the sign that God has given to all of us has already come in the form of Jesus Christ. He is the sign that we already have received. And that sign given to us says to us, yes, if God is willing to give us his very best, will he not also give you everything else you need? That's where we, as the people of God on this side of the cross, we already have the sign. The sign is Jesus. And because that sign has already been given to us, then we can count on the fact that God is going to give us everything else that we need. He's given us Jesus, so won't he give us everything else? That's how we're to look at the darkness. That's how we're to look at the threat. That's how we're to look at whatever seems to be threatening us. We're to look at it in light of the sign that God has already given to us. And say, wow. He's already given us Jesus. Who took our place on the cross, died the death that we deserve, took our sin, took our death, and then... He raised Jesus from the dead so I can live a new life. Okay. If he's willing to do that, then yeah, perhaps he's willing to do more. <laughs> right? But a lot of us, we want to be polite, but our politeness is really a cover for doubt. Our politeness is really a cover for a lack of faith. God isn't looking for us to be nice with him, not in the midst of darkness. Nice is not going to go any, it's not going to do us any good. Just being respectful is not going to be any good. What God is looking for is people who are willing to dare to take all the grace that he has for us and then defy the darkness with it. Take the grace, defy the darkness. Take the grace, defy the threat. That's how we really experience Emmanuel, God with us. So today, again, we, we stand here as a people who are on the other side of the sign. We're on the other side of the sign. Here's, here's what God says to Ahaz after he says, nope, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. Verse 13, then Isaiah said, hear now, you house of David. Remember, God made a promise to Judah that he would always extend the line of David. David would always be on the throne. And so he's making a promise now, not just to Ahaz, but to the whole house of David. So here now, house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? So he says in verse 14, you didn't ask me for a sign? Fine, I'm going to give you one anyway. Verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He'll be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. 
He's saying, look, you're not asking me for a sign? Fine, I'm gonna give you one anyway. There will be a virgin. Someone who is a virgin is going to give birth to a son and he will be God with us, Emmanuel. And this is Jesus. And in the phrase, he'll eat curds and honey. That's the food of poverty. That's the food that those who were poor would eat. And this is who Jesus was. Jesus, who was homeless his life. Jesus from Nazareth, some nowhere town, from nowhere. This is who Jesus would be. And this is the sign. So when the angel appears to Joseph, Joseph, who had already found out that Mary was pregnant with child, Joseph was faced with a threat. He was faced with darkness. He was faced with the, the threat of his community, who would put him into shame if he would marry Mary. And Joseph, seeing that threat and acknowledging that if he was to go with Mary, that there would be all kinds of darkness that he would have to face if he stayed with her. And so he did what he thought he should do, which is to quietly divorce her. The angel of God comes to Joseph in that moment where he's facing that threat and says exactly what this sign was. He says in, in Matthew 1.20, you can look at that. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. There's the promise, right? You see the threat, you face the darkness, God gives this promise. What's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. There's more promise. Verse 22. Now, here's Matthew's interpretation. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Joseph receives the same promise that Ahaz did. But Joseph, looking at the threat of darkness, receives that promise. And verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. So centuries after Ahaz, Joseph receives the same promise from God in the threat of darkness. And Joseph would have to deal with the threat of darkness again and again. Herod was going to come against um, him and his family and, and Jesus. You would have the Romans eventually who would come against him. You would have the community around him that would constantly shame and be suspicious of this scandalous pregnancy he would have to deal with the threat again and again and again, but Joseph received the promise and he defied the threat. He's a godly man. He's a godly man who shows us the way, who shows us how we are to experience God with us. I wonder today, what is the darkness that is at your door? What is the darkness that threatens to undo you? Will you name it with God? Will you allow God to name it with you? What does God say about the darkness that you're facing? And as you do that, what is the promise that God has for you? How can you count on that promise when you face that darkness? And then as you receive that, can you trust God's promise enough to face that darkness and defy it, to actively say to that darkness, whatever that darkness is, cancer, COVID, job loss, whatever it is, addiction, bondage of any kind, when you see that darkness, can you say to that darkness, I defy you. You don't have the last word because God has given me a promise and God is greater than you. Can you walk into that darkness and defy it and say, nope, I'm going to walk in obedience and trust in God because God has called me and God has given me a promise and he will not fail to come through on it. Will you be able to do that? I hope you can. 
If you do, then you will understand what Christmas is all about. You'll understand what the Advent promise of Emmanuel is all about. But will you? Where are you in these steps? Are you on step one? Is God saying, come and name the darkness with me? Are you on step two? Do you need to hear God's promise about what he says to you, the guidance that he wants to give to you about how to navigate through that and the strength of who he is? Or are you number three? Have you yet to defy the darkness? Where are you? How can you experience Emmanuel, the fullness of Emmanuel, not just in a sentimental way, not just in a nostalgic way, but in a way that allows you to defy the darkness in the strength of God? Let's shift our focus now as we go to the table of the Lord. Jesus named the darkness. He faced it and he received the promise. And it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. When he endured the cross, he defied the darkness. He defied the enemy. He defied sin. He defied death. And we, we are the recipients of him being able to trust in God the Father, and trust in God's goodness to raise him from the dead so that we can say, like Paul, death, where's your stinger? Death, speak all the threats you want, but you're a vanquished foe. We can do that because Jesus, Jesus, he named the darkness, received the promise, for the joy set before him, and he defied the threat. Will we join him? I want to encourage you to join him on this path. Join him. This is what he is calling all of us to do on this path so that we would know the fullness of Emmanuel, God with us. Let's join him on that path. Whatever the darkness is, would you in this moment just name it? Name it with God. You don't have to be afraid of it. Not when you're in God's presence. So communion is just simply God's presence with us. Isn't that what the word means? Communion. We're communing with God. So let's commune with God so that we'll see the darkness the way we ought to see the darkness in light of the glory of God.